pastors, the theology students, and congregation members who are attending Shincheonji Online Seminar, testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings, it is nice to meet you. My name is Yu Taegu, and I'll be your host today. I would like to thank everyone who came to Shincheonji Online Seminar, which is being broadcast to the whole world. This current seminar series is made out of contents every believer all over the world must know in order to keep the new covenant Jesus gave us. I pray and hope that all of you who are attending this seminar from many different parts of the world will receive great grace and perception from God through this precious time. Let us first offer up a prayer to God with our hearts united, then start the seminar. Our Holy Father God, we thank you for your grace as you've guided us to the word of truth. You said that the Word is God and there is life in the Word. So please allow us to receive life in our spirit through your Word of life today. Though we are only to die, you gave us life. You've sent us the Word of Truth to redeem us from sin. Help us to plant your Word deep in our hearts, which are like the field so we can look toward the hope of heaven. Allow us the eyes to see, ears to hear, and mind to perceive, so we can understand your will at this time. We believe you will guide us today, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. This online seminar is being conducted with strict adherence to COVID-19 guidelines and social distancing regulations. Now is the time to listen to the Word of Life, which is the most important for us. Shincheonji Church has been testifying to many contents through the Bible regarding the parables of the secrets of heaven. You can revisit all the past contents via videos online, so I ask that you watch closely with your eyes and ears focused. Today, Instructor Yi chung from Simon Tribe of Shincheonji Church of Jesus, the Temple of the Tabernacle of the Testimony, will plainly explain what was sealed for the past 6,000 years regarding the figurative death and resurrection. Let us perceive each verse of the words that are testified today deep in our hearts as we will hear the explanation of what death and resurrection refer to in the Bible as we are reminded of the fact that Christianity is often called the religion of resurrection. Let's welcome up Instructor Yi jung with a big round of applause. Welcome to the pastors and members of the global communities whose hope is in heaven and eternal life. I am Lee jung a center instructor from the 12 tribes of Shincheonji taught by the leader of Simon Tribe. Our tribe leader was taught by the chairman of Shincheonji, Lee Man Hee. Thank you so much for attending Shincheonji's testimony on the Parables of the Secrets of Heaven and their True Meanings Seminar. The subject of today's lesson is on the Parable of Death and Resurrection, Elementary Lesson 18. At this time, we will find out what the true meaning of spiritual resurrection is in the Bible and the faith in resurrection we must have today according to to the word. I believe that some of the pastors in attendance at today's seminar know this, while some pastors 
will not know very well. I would be grateful if you could listen carefully to what I am saying according to the Bible today. There are two types of death and resurrection in the Bible, the physical and spiritual. In John chapter 11, about 2,000 years ago, Lazarus died physically and was resurrected through Jesus. At that time, death and resurrection was physical death and resurrection. Today, in this lesson, we will look at spiritual death and resurrection explained figuratively through physical death and resurrection. A person who is not physically breathing anymore has physically died. And the place where the dead are buried is called a tomb. However, if the dead are given life and they come out from the tomb, it is called resurrection. Today, we will take a look at the spiritual meaning of breath of life, death, tomb, and resurrection, which are compared through these physical principles. Let us first start by looking at the answer to the parable we are going over today. First, a person has a body, a spirit, and a soul. And within a person, the spirit, soul, and body become one. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 to 30, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the spirit or the soul. Therefore, the body can kill or it can die. However, it is only God who can destroy the spirit, correct? The figure of death we are talking about today does not refer to a person's flesh that died, but referring to a person whose spirit has died. When the spirit dies, the person becomes nothing but an empty body. In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said that his words were spirit and they were life. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it is written that the Word in the beginning is God, light, and life. Those who do not have the Word of life, according to the Bible, is like a dead person, since they are dead in spirit. Thus, the figure of death refers to the state in which a person has no Word of life. And the parable of resurrection refers to the resurrection of the Spirit with the Word of Life. Spiritually, it comes from hearing the Word of Life, which is life, from a place that is like a tomb, that is, from an organization of lies. I will explain in detail why such an answer came about through the Word. But first, let's read the parable Recorded in John chapter 5, verse 29. And come out, those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Yes, well read. Just as we have read in John chapter 5, verse 29, those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. What kind of resurrection would you like to participate in? Yes, of course, we want to participate in the resurrection of life, correct? Then we need to know what is good and also what is evil. The Bible testifies about good and evil very well. Through this seminar, I hope that you will be able to distinguish good from evil and participate in the resurrection of life. In order to understand death, let's first look at the parable of the breath of life. 
What do you think is the true meaning of the breath of life? The figurative breath of life refers to the word of life. Let's understand why by looking at the physical characteristics of breath of life. The breath of life broken down in Chinese characters are translated as the energy that gives life. Then a person without the breath of life is a dead person. If it is physical life that gives life to our bodies, what is the spiritual life that gives life to our spirit and soul? Let's read John chapter 6, verse 63. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yes, well read. In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you our spirit, and they are life. Therefore, the spiritual breath of life that gives life to our spirit and soul is God's word of life. This means listening to the words that came out of the mouth of Jesus is what will give life to our spirit. Let's check a little more through the words of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. It says, If God actually made man out of literal dust and breathed into his nostrils with literal breath, Shouldn't it say the man became flesh? However, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it is said that he became a living being, that is, his soul came to life. Then we can see that the breath of life is the energy that gives life to the spirit, not the body. So, what is it? That gives life to our spirit. Let's read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Yes, well read. Looking at the words of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it is written that the Word in the beginning was God. Since the Word is God, if the Word is with me, then God will be with me, correct? It is written also that there is life. In the word. The word then is like the breath of life that gives life to our spirit. Just as all things are supplied with life through the light, rain, and air from the heavens, we receive life in our spirit through the word of God. According to John chapter 17, verse 8, at the first coming, Jesus spoke the words he received from God, and thus those very words Jesus spoke were like the breath of life that could save a person's spirit. Through whom can we receive this word of life at the second coming? In Revelation chapter 10, there is the appearance of the new John, the overcomer who receives the open scroll through an angel and eats it. Thus, at the time of the second coming, the promised shepherd, the overcomer, is the one who receives the open scroll, which is like the breath of life, and the word he delivers, 
will become the breath of life that saves our spirit. 2,000 years ago, the disciples received spiritual breath of life from the words that came out of the mouth of Jesus, and thus their spirits received life. As such, I hope that all pastors and congregation members who are listening to the seminar today will receive God's spiritual breath of life and be with God through this online seminar. Secondly, let's look at spiritual death figuratively expressed through physical death. Physical death is a death of the body because there is no physical life within it. There is an old saying that the dead do not speak. If the dead is asked, what is your hope? Will the dead answer? That is correct, of course not. Not only do the dead not speak, but they have no sense of feeling on their body and they have no hope in that way. Similarly, a person whose spirit is dead will have no feel or hope in their hearts. What is the parable of death? The parable of death is a state in which a person has no word of life in them. Just like a person who does not have literal life in them are considered physically dead, those who do not have spiritual breath of life in them, that is the word, are spiritually dead, although their body is physically alive. Now let's check through the Bible. Let's read Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Yes, well read. God made a promise to Adam, saying, You may eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. However, if we look at the words of Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, we see that Eve ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil through the serpent's deception, and Adam also ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil through Eve's deception. Although God told Adam that he would surely die if he ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam did not die, but instead, lived a long life until the age of 930 years. God clearly said he would surely die on the day he ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. But what happened to Adam, who got a chance to live up to the age of 930 years? In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, it is written that the soul that sins will die by breaking the covenant with God. Adam became a sinner, and thus his spirit died. Isn't that correct? Adam was one with a living spirit, created by God's breath of life, and was capable of living eternally. However, he broke the covenant with God and ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. As a result of his sin, his spirit died. This is what we call spiritual death. Adam's spirit died, and after that, even his body died. I hope we too can use this as a mirror and a warning for us so that we can perceive the promises we must keep and be able to keep our promises with God. Also, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 to 22, Jesus said that one of his disciples came to him and asked if he could first go and bury his father who had passed. That is, when Jesus said, Let the dead bury their own dead, and you follow me. 
But how can a dead body bury the dead? Who then are the dead mentioned first? And who are the dead who should be buried? This was a message that the people of Jerusalem, whose flesh were alive, but their spirits were dead as a result of them not having the word, that is like the breath of life, should go and bury the disciples' dead father. Someone might misunderstand these words and think Jesus is an ignorant person with no compassion for the disciples' father, not allowing him to bury his own father. However, we should understand that Jesus feared that the spirit of that disciple would die after hearing the words of the people in Jerusalem whose spirits were dead. If we do not understand this parable, we may misunderstand the Bible. Thus, I sincerely hope that all pastors and congregation members who are listening to these words will be able to fully understand this parable and the heart of God and Jesus through the seminar. Now, I will organize the parable of death. Just as a body dies and goes to the grave if there is no physical life, without spiritual life, that is, the Word, the spirit goes into the spiritual grave since it is spiritually dead. And according to Mark chapter 12, verse 27, it is written that God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So those who are dead in spirit cannot be considered as God's people, and they will not be able to enter the kingdom of heaven as a result. Shouldn't we then reflect upon ourselves in the mirror of the Bible to see whether we are alive or dead in the sight of God? I earnestly hope that all of us can reach the kingdom of heaven with complete understanding through the word of God, which is like the breath of life. Third, let's look at the meaning of the spiritual grave figuratively expressed as a physical grave. First, let's look at the characteristics of tombs. A physical grave or tomb is a place where a dead body is buried. A spiritual tomb is a place where the dead spirits are buried. If a person's spirit does not have the breath of life, that is, the word of life, God cannot be with that person, and thus that spirit is considered dead in the sight of God, correct? Since a dead spirit is buried within the body, then isn't that body considered to be like a grave? In addition, an organization of lies in which people with dead spirits are gathered can also be called a grave. Let's examine through the Bible. First, let's read Romans chapter 3, verse 13. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Yes, well read. Romans chapter 3, verse 13 teaches us that those who do not seek God and do not understand the Word have throats that are like open graves. Since words of lies come out from the throats of those who do not understand the Word of Life, doesn't that mean they are killing people's spirits? Therefore, even though the body might be alive, God's Spirit left those who do not understand the Word of Life. And since their spirit dies as a result, their body becomes a spiritual grave. In order for our body not to become a spiritual grave, our spirit must become a living spirit by receiving the Word of God. If the Spirit of God departs and the body containing the dead spirit is like a spiritual grave, 
then the place where the dead spirits are gathered can also be called a grave, correct? Let's read Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Yes, well read. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus proclaimed woe seven times and called the hypocritical Pharisees and teachers of the law whitewashed tombs. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were false shepherds of the devil, and there was no spiritual breath of life of God's word in them at all. And the Jews, at the time of the first coming, taught and reared by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law with the lies of Satan, were spiritually dead. It is written in Luke chapter 11, verse 44, that Pharisees were unmarked graves. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, Jesus said the Pharisees and teachers of the law were brood of vipers, they were snakes, and thus they were the reality of spiritual tombs who killed the spirits of the chosen people at the first coming with lies that were like poison. Even if a church appears to be with God, claiming to believe in God, praying and offering service to God in its outer appearance, but there is no word of life there, and instead words of lies are spoken, then in reality, that church is merely like a spiritual tomb full of dead spirits. Shouldn't we know correctly if whether the place we belong to is a place with the word of life or without the word of life? If it is a place where words of lies other than God's words of life are being taught, we will have to open the grave and come out from there. Through the seminar, I sincerely hope that you will fully understand God's word of life, belong on the side of God, and participate in heaven and eternal life. In summary, just like a physical grave is a place where the dead are buried, a spiritual grave is a body where the Spirit of God departed from. And furthermore, it represents an organization of lies in which dead spirits are buried. Next, let's look at the fourth parable, the figurative resurrection. But first, let's take a look at the meaning and the different types of resurrection. Resurrection means to live again. In the Bible, there are two types of resurrection. There is physical resurrection, in which a dead body physically resurrects. But there is also spiritual resurrection, in which the body is alive, but the dead spirit within them is raised. About 2,000 years ago, Jesus came as the Son of God and performed many miracles. One of them, was a miracle of physically resurrecting Lazarus from death to life in John chapter 11. However, what we are going to look into today is not about physical resurrection, but a spiritual resurrection. Reorganizing what we learned earlier will help in easily understanding the meaning of spiritual resurrection. The figure of death means the death of a person's spirit without the breath of life, that is, the word of life. What is the true meaning of spiritual resurrection figuratively represented by physical resurrection? Yes, it is when the body and the spirit come to life again. In other words, it is when the spirit comes back to life 
by the word of life. And just like a physical grave opens for the physical body to come to life, in the same way, spiritual resurrection is coming out of a spiritual grave that is an organization of lies. Let us examine this through the Bible. God prophesied in the Old and New Testaments that a spiritual resurrection would occur. First, let's look at the prophecies of the Old Testament. According to the words recorded in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14, God showed Ezekiel a vision where there was a valley full of bones. Let's read from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 6. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones, I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Yes, well read. The words of Ezekiel chapter 37 were prophecies recorded through the prophet Ezekiel about 2,600 years ago that fulfilled about 600 years later after it was recorded at the first coming of Jesus. In verses 1 to 10, it is written that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Ezekiel, and he placed Ezekiel in the middle of the valley, where there were many bones that were very dry. The many bones in the middle of the valley means there were many dead within the graves. God called Ezekiel the Son of Man and told him to prophesy the breath of life into them. Ezekiel prophesied to the breath, and the breath of life entered into them, and they came to life. And according to verses 11 to verse 14, these bones represented the whole house of Israel. Wouldn't it have been a terrible event if literally all the people of Israel became bones at the time of first coming when Ezekiel's prophecies fulfilled? And these bones say that their bones are dry and they have no hope. If this was literal, how could these bones speak? The book of Ezekiel is a book of prophecies. And as we all already know, the book of prophecies are written in parables. In other words, these bones are not referring to dead bodies, but the spiritually dead, and bringing to life their dead spirits by prophesying the breath of life, that is, God's words of life, to these bones. Let's summarize the content of Ezekiel chapter 37 with some visuals. In Ezekiel chapter 37, we see that the middle of the valley is full of bones. This place can be considered a tome full of bones, correct? Then God called Ezekiel, the son of man, and had him prophesy the breath of life. And they came to life, opened their tombs, came out, and entered the land of Israel. This is a resurrection from death to life. This prophecy in the book of Ezekiel was fulfilled at the first coming of Jesus 
about 600 years later after it was recorded. Let's read John chapter 5, verses 24 to 29. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed by this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Yes, well read. In John chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus said, A time is coming, and has now come, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. At that time, who were the dead? Who heard the words of Jesus, the Son of God? Verse 28 says, that a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear His voice. So, did Jesus testify to the Word in a cemetery 2,000 years ago? No. It was the Jews hearing Jesus who were considered spiritually dead. Just like it is written, those who hear the voice of the Son of God will come to life. It was their spirits that came to life again. After hearing the words of God testified to by Jesus, which is like the breath of life. According to Matthew chapter 23, verse 2, it is written that the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting in Moses' seat. Since the teachers of the law and Pharisees, who were false shepherds, were in charge of Judaism, all the spirits of the Israelites at the first coming died because of the lies of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Therefore, wouldn't this organization of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees be the reality of tombs at the first coming? On the other hand, God prophesied the words of life that is like the breath of life through Jesus. At the time of first coming, wouldn't those who perceive the word through Jesus, like the twelve disciples, come out of the organization of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which was like a tomb, and come to Jesus? This is spiritual resurrection coming out of the tomb from death to life. Furthermore, all of Israel coming out of the tomb and entering Israel is not referring to the newly created spiritual Israel made up of Jesus and His disciples, but physical Israel, right? At the time of first coming, in order to receive life and for the Spirit to live, they had to come to Jesus. That is how the prophecies of Ezekiel 37 fulfilled. Just as there were people who received resurrection of life like this 2,000 years ago, shouldn't we who are living in the era of the second coming today also participate in the resurrection of life? Then let's look into the resurrection at the second coming. In Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 to 3, it is written that all nations are destroyed by the maddening wine of adulteries of Babylon, the kingdom of demons. The wine of adulteries coming from Babylon is referring to Satan's lies preached by false shepherds. As a result, the chosen people are killed and therefore, Babylon is considered a spiritual grave 
where dead spirits are gathered. This is spiritual Babylon, a place parable similar to the Babylon in the Old Testament times. And Jesus calls out to God's people from the spiritual grave, telling them to come out from there. Let's read Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Yes, well read. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, Jesus calls out, Come out of her, my people. If someone hears the words of God, and comes out of a spiritual grave, an organization of lies like Babylon, wouldn't this be considered the work of resurrection today? Also, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, it is written that those who are with Jesus are His called, chosen, and faithful followers. That means they will come out of their spiritual graves and be with Jesus as those resurrected, right? Where then do we go today after coming out of spiritual Babylon that is like a tomb? And through whom can we receive the word of life today? In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, Jesus said, I have sent my messenger to give you this testimony for the churches. The things mentioned here are the revealed words that clearly makes known the reality to the fulfilled prophecies of Revelation. Today, Jesus chooses a messenger of Jesus to testify to Jesus' own words. Therefore, today we can see that Jesus' messenger who speaks on behalf is the one who testifies to the words of life, which is the breath of life. Also in Revelation chapter 10, it is recorded that John will receive and eat the revelation from heaven and prophesy again to many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The John mentioned here is not referring to the literal Apostle John who recorded the book of Revelation 2,000 years ago, but it is referring to a person parable, that is, a shepherd who appears today when this prophecy is fulfilled. Shouldn't we come to a place where the revealed word, that is, the words of life, the breath of life, is testified to through the promised shepherd? Today, in the midst of the fall of all nations, with Babylon's wine of adulteries, that is, through the lies testified to by false shepherds, if Jesus delivers the word of life, through a messenger who will speak on behalf, then coming out of the spiritual tomb of lies and going to the place where the truth is, is resurrecting from death to life. Through the seminar, I hope that you will fully perceive the words of life, the breath of life, and become believers who participate in the resurrection of life. I'll wrap things up today. The parable of breath of life is the word of life. The parable of death refers to the condition of not having the word of life. The parable of grave is the organization of lies. And the parable of resurrection is a spirit that is made alive with the Word. At the time of Revelation fulfillment, in the last days, the nations will fall 
from Babylon's wine of adulteries, which refer to lies. They are spiritually killed by Satan's false shepherds and are imprisoned in Babylon or spiritually a tomb. We must perceive the reality of the tomb through the prophecies of the New Testament and come out from there to the place where the promised shepherd testifies to the breath of life, the words of the open book in Revelation chapter 10. This is resurrection from death to life. We who are living at the time of the second coming of Christ must perceive all the secrets of heaven. This is because if we do not understand the secrets of heaven, we will not be able to go to heaven. Today is the era when all the parables are being clearly testified to just as Jesus promised. The reason we can testify to this clearly is because what was spoken in parables has now appeared as a reality. Then next time, we will talk about the parable of groom, bride, widow, and the fatherless in the Parable Elementary Series Lesson 19. The instructor who will give you the next lecture is a very special person who is more funny and makes it easier to understand than myself. We hope to hear from you next time. I hope today was a time you received much grace and understanding through the words of God and Jesus. All of us are one in God and Jesus. Let's shout together that we are one. We are one. Let us pray. Holy and exalted Father God, the source of life and blessings, I sincerely thank you for being with me today through the Shincheonji's testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings seminar. Today was a time to understand the figurative meaning of death and resurrection. I believe that the word you have given is life and grace to our souls. Please be with all the hearts who are in attendance. We believe this is truly the time to resurrect to life through the word of life. Please grant us grace so we can all participate in the resurrection of life by helping us to understand the word with earnest heart every day. Please unite us in the word and protect us with strength in spirit and body until the time we meet again. Thank you, and I pray all this with earnest faith in the name of loving Jesus. Amen. Yes. Thank you for listening to the end. As we carry out our life of faith, we wait for Jesus, who is our bridegroom, and we want to receive Him when He returns. Then, why was Jesus described as the bridegroom to begin with? And do you know who the bride of Jesus is? The kingdom of heaven is described as a wedding banquet, and it is said that it's a parable. Who is a king who gave the wedding banquet, and who is a son who becomes married? We'll need to accurately find out the time, place, and proof of the house of that wedding banquet so we can find the place. Just as you've seen in the video, we'll continue with our seminar series with the topic of Introductory Lesson 19, The Figurative Bridegroom, Bride, Widow, and Orphan. Please attend our next seminar too, as it will start at the same time as it did today. I hope all of us can enter the Kingdom of Heaven. Shincheonji Online Seminar, Testimony on the Parables of the Secrets of Heaven and Their True Meanings, is being broadcast via Shincheonji's official YouTube channel in 24 different languages at the same time to the whole world. Numerous pastors and theology schools have already shown much interest in our Revelation Seminar, which was conducted until December of last year, and they've been vying to sign MOU with Shincheonji Church of Jesus to be one with us.
신천지 Church is open to anyone who loves God's Word. If you have any questions about our church or our teaching or the seminar lesson today, please call the number you see on the screen, which represents each tribe. We'll answer all of your questions kindly in detail. Now let us finish today's seminar program by offering up the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as if also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being with us today.